All right. Well, the next speaker, I think everybody has probably heard in a variety of uh, venues, uh, uh, Tripp is the Chief of Infectious Disease at Wild Cornell Medical uh, uh, College. Uh, he's the co-chair of the antiretroviral guidelines for NIH. He's the co-chair of the COVID guidelines uh, for NIH, uh, and he's involved in multiple studies. So he's going to tell us what the future is for antiretroviral therapy. Tripp? Great. Thank you, Henry. Good afternoon, everybody. Let's talk about the future of ART. I have no disclosures. Learning objectives are to identify new innovations with our current antiretroviral therapy, and then learn about new classes that are in development. Let's start with the question, how many drugs currently are FDA approved for the treatment of HIV? 21, 29, 33, 35, or 41? Okay, this is a big split on the answer here. Uh, the correct answer is 35 unique drugs. So to know where we're going with ART, we have to know where we are. Where are we at the end of 2023? As just mentioned, there are 35 US FDA approved drugs in six broad mechanistic classes. The older classes, the nucleosides, non-nucleosides, and protease inhibitors, and then the newer classes, the integrase, entry, and capsid inhibitors. As you all know, we now start ART at all stages of HIV infection, and initial ART regimens worldwide now have one standard strategy, and that is one to two nucleosides with an integrase inhibitor. For virologic failure, the next regimen should include at least two active drugs, according to the guidelines, one with a high barrier to resistance. So here are the US DHHS treatment guidelines, the recommended initial regimens for most people. As stated, one to two nukes plus an integrase inhibitor, and you'll notice only two integrase inhibitors now make the recommended initial list, either Bictegravir or dolutegravir. Bictegravir co-formulated, as you know, with TAF and FTC. Dolutegravir co-formulated with abacavir 3TC, or regimen number four, dolutegravir 3TC, the two-drug regimen, or dolutegravir with either form of tenofovir and FTC or 3TC. Those are the recommended initial regimens. Three out of four of them are one pill, once a day therapy. So what's new with these regimens? Well, there's a new formulation of tenofovir, 3TC, and dolutegravir called internationally TLD. 80% of the world's population taking antiretroviral therapy is on TLD. So it is the world's regimen. As we know, it is a first-line ART regimen, but the three drugs have disparate physical chemical properties. What these investigators in this study did was to use a nanoparticle technology to stabilize and assemble these three drugs with lipid excipients. And their goal was to develop a new formulation which would be suitable for subcutaneous injection. What you see here are single doses in non-human primates, and they studied seven monkeys at three different dosing levels and the dark lines show that they did achieve the concentrations uh, for all three drugs with this new preparation. You can see the dotted horizontal line was the target level. And they concluded that four week subcutaneous dosing with this new formulation could be possible. And obviously we want to see human study results uh, for this to progress further. Well, one of the newer drugs that we have been struggling with is cabotegravir. As you know, an integrase inhibitor similar to dolutegravir, it was potent in 10-year-old studies now in people with HIV in its oral form, but the excitement about the drug was the nanotechnology formulation and the fact that it is the first injectable antiretroviral agent. 
Phase three studies used injectable cabotegravir together with injectable rilpivirine, the NNRTI, as a treatment switch strategy. And that demonstrated non-inferiority in three big studies compared to continuing standard oral treatment regimens. And these have all been well studied. That led to the US FDA approval of the combination of IM cabotegravir and IM rilpivirine monthly for switch therapy. And that was all the way back in January, 2021, nearly three years ago. And the package insert says this strategy is for patients who are undetectable on ART without a history of virologic failure, drug resistance, or chronic hep B infection, because obviously the two drugs used don't have activity against hepatitis B. While monthly injections were tough to ask people to, to come forward for, luckily the third study in the bullet points up above tested a every month strategy and found it was non-inferior to the monthly strategy. And that led to the FDA approval of the IM regimen month, every other month. And that was about a year ago in, or almost two years ago, I guess, in 2022. Also, we began to use cabotegravir IM with an oral lead-in, and that was because once you inject these drugs, you can't remove them. So if there were any idiosyncratic reactions, that could be a problem. But what we learned was that lead-in dosing could be optional because they did not see uh, effects on any of the three large studies listed there with the use of oral cabotegravir. So the FDA updated the package insert back in March of last year. So there we are with cabotegravir. Now, one of the struggles is that we often turn to this re regimen for people who have adherence challenges, yet the package insert says that you have to be undetectable on your oral regimen to switch to it. So what about using cabotegravir in people with detectable viremia? So the San Franciscans, the Ward 86 clinic, did a demonstration project on 133 of their clinic patients who were started on the all injectable regimen of cab and rilpivirine. Uh, they had an average age of 46, 88% were men and over 60% were non-white. And this was a challenged group, over 40% had unstable housing or homelessness and about a third were using substances. Now, 76 of them were suppressed on the oral antiretroviral regimen, so they had the indication for the FDA guidelines, but another 57 actually had ongoing viremia and still there uh, in this demonstration project were switched to the all injectable regimen. So how did they do? Well, it turns out 98% had virologic suppression, and I'm just focusing on the group that had detectable viremia. And uh, another patient had a two log drop in viral load. The remaining two did experience virologic failure. And so you see that graph for you here. Again, these are the 57 with detectable viremia going on the all injectable regimen. Now this is a small study. It was conducted in a San Francisco clinic that had lots and lots of support. So they had drop-in hours for patients and they actually went into the community if a person missed their dose and injected them in the community. Not all of us are capable of having that level of support. So I think we could say or sum up that cabral pivoring does suppress viral load, even in the presence of detectable viremia and suboptimal adherence. But I will caution that it is premature to apply this to most patients in clinics. And we do need more evidence to apply this in a routine visit. ACTG currently has a study that's nearly fully enrolled testing this in a non-adherent group, and we await those answers. Well, how else can we make cabotegravir more friendly? There are new formulations that are in the pipeline. One could be injected every three months as opposed to every two and use as an auto injector for subcutaneous administration. So that would be a leap forward to the IM buttock injections that have to be given by healthcare providers. There's actually another ultra long formulation, which is two times concentrated, so reduces the volume of the injections 
And this could be used every four to six months for administration. And both of these have studies that are being planned. There's another one, a pro-drug of cabotegravir, which is an extended release nano formulation that has been studied in animals. This is injectable and pharmacokinetics support yearly dosing. And what you see in the published graph below, the green line is the formulation of cabotegravir we have today. You can see you get good levels and then they trail off. The horizontal line is the target for effective levels. And the red line is this new prodrug extended release nano formulation. And you can see good levels that achieve targets out to a year of follow-up in these uh, mice and rats. So imagine that you could have a once a year cabotegravir injection while more data are needed, but exciting. Cab is also being explored with another way of giving drugs and that would be a micro needle patch. Now uh, it looks kind of spiky there in the photo, but it turns out that these spikes which contain the drug and slowly release it don't actually touch the nerves. So these are painless patches that are being explored. And there is some human data here. Each line represents a different concentration of the needle patch with cabotegravir. And you can see some of these achieve the target level, again, the red horizontal line. So patches are being explored with cabotegravir and additional antiretroviral drugs. Well, often in treatment experience patients, we need to turn to drugs with newer mechanisms of action. And the class of HIV entry inhibitors often plays that role. You'll recall that HIV entry is a three-step process as shown for you here. The first is HIV binding through its GP120, glycoprotein 120, to the CD4 receptor on the T cell, that's CD4 binding. That induces a conformational change, which allows binding to a second receptor called the co-receptor or the chemokine receptor, either CCR5 or less commonly CXCR4. And then th that leads to fusion of the viral membrane with the host cell membrane in the third step of HIV entry. So three steps allows three chances to inhibit. Of course, we've had a fusion inhibitor for a number of years in Fuvertide, but not used commonly because it's twice a day subcutaneous injections. We've also had the chemokine receptor inhibitor uh, Maraviroc, which binds not to HIV, but to the CCR5 receptor. And we use this occasionally, particularly in treatment experience patients with R5 virus. And then the most recent HIV entry inhibitors target the first step of CD4 binding. There's fostemzivir, which is a small molecule that binds to GP120. And there's ibilizumab, which is a monoclonal antibody that binds to the CD4 molecule. So we, again, often turn to these in treatment experience patients. The data for treatment experience with multi-drug resistant HIV, the strategy we use is to add a new active drug, often a drug with a new mechanism of action, and then optimize the background regimen with history and drug resistance testing. That was done in the registrational study of ibilizumab published in the New England Journal about five years ago. Um, it was a small study of 40 people. 43% of these heavily treatment experienced patients were able to regain virologic control, and that supported FDA approval of ibilizumab in 2018. It is a monoclonal antibody, has to be given every two weeks by infusion, and so relatively inconvenient and not widely used. More used is the small molecule fostemzivir, which is an oral medication. The BRIGHT study enrolled 272 heavily treatment experienced patients, and they were able to achieve with the new active drug plus optimized background strategy, 60% suppressed below 40 by the end of two years. And that led to FDA approval back in 2020. We've now seen uh, follow-up data showing durable virologic results at two years and recently published this year, five-year data. So that is hope for treatment experience patients. We also have the newest drug of the 35 to be, 
be FDA approved, which is the first HIV capsid inhibitor. You'll re recall in the life cycle, once HIV is fused and exudes its um, inner core into the cytoplasm of the cell, shown in green here, that's the capsid, which is encapsulating the viral RNA and the viral enzymes. That's transported to the nucleus and reverse transcription is occurring, but to release the contents, the capsid has to disassemble. Later in the life cycle, when viral proteins are assembling at the cell surface and are then released, the capsid has to reassemble. So the new class of capsid inhibitors is a unique mechanism of action, and it targets both these steps. So both capsid disassembly and capsid assembly. And as a new mechanism of action, it should have activity even in multidrug resistant HIV. So the lead compound that has been FDA approved is lenacapavir. It's potent in the test tube and has a long half-life. It's being developed both with oral and subcutaneous formulations, showed good activity against HIV in a phase one subcutaneous study. And then the excitement about this study was a phase two, three study in heavily treatment experienced patients. And the technique here, the strategy was to add oral lenacapavir, and that showed antiretroviral activity. But that, then at day 15, optimize the background and change to a formulation of lenacapavir given subcutaneously every six months. So this is truly long-acting antiretrovirals. And my colleague, Serena Siegel-Mauer here in New York, was the lead author showing durable suppression in, this, in a majority of patients in this group at 26 weeks. That led to both uh, EMA, that's European Medicines Association, and US FDA approval just last year. That has also led to further exploration of capsid inhibitors as daily and weekly oral treatment regimens and as Q6 month subcutaneous injectable treatment regimens. We've also seen durability data on this initial study for 26 weeks, and you can see durable data. This is 52-week data that was presented at CROI and then published later. Overall, 78% of the participants were suppressed using lenacapavir in an optimized background. And in the figure on the left, you can say it really didn't matter between age, sex, race, and region of the world. And on the right-hand side, responses were similar by baseline CD4 and viral load level. And then we heard a follow-up two-year data for the same group of people, 82% remained suppressed through the end of two years, and that was at ID week earlier this year. The other population that lenacapavir is being explored in is treatment-naive patients. That study was called Calibrate, Randomized Open Label Controlled Induction Maintenance Study of treatment-naive people with detectable viral loads and CD4s over 200. You can see 182 people were randomized to one of four arms that are color-coded for you there. The first two arms both started with subcutaneous lenacapavir every six months and traditional TAF-FTC, and then simplified to a two-drug regimen. So in the blue first regimen to sub-Q lenacapavir and TAF, in the orange second regimen to sub-Q lenacapavir and bictegravir, the INSTI. And then three and four were control arms. So oral lenacapavir given with TAF and FTC daily is number three. Number four was TAF, FTC, and bictegravir. So how'd they do? We're looking at the proportion suppressed to less than 50. And basically, everybody did well. So you can see... Uh, in the 90% suppression rates for all four regimens. And this certainly supports further development of lenacapavir in a treatment-naive population. All right, those are the drugs we have today. What about drugs in the pipeline? The good news is that the pipeline for HIV continues to be full. And we have a number of compounds in development as shown for you here. In the existing classes, nukes, non-nukes, protease inhibitors, entry inhibitors, integrase, and capsid inhibitors, as well as two new classes of drugs, the maturation inhibitors and the broadly neutralizing antibodies, or BNABs.
So let me focus on one new nucleoside, which is fairly long in development, and two new mechanisms of action. His latrovir is, of all the compounds I just showed you, the one that's farthest along in development. This is a nucleoside analog. It's an adenosine analog, and it is a DNA chain terminator. It inhibits reverse transcriptase in a novel way. It prevents translocation of the viral DNA chain. So it's an NRTTI nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor. Part of the excitement about this compound is its long half-life, 50 to 6, 60 hours in plasma. No drug-drug interactions anticipated, as with most of the nucleosides. It's potent in the test tube and has both low-dose oral and parenteral formulations that uh, are in development. Phase 1b was a single oral dose at time zero, and you can see viral load levels are suppressed on the order of nearly two logs at the highest doses 10 days later. So again, a long-acting oral agent. So this launched a whole fleet of studies looking at infrequent dosing for treatment and prevention, daily, weekly, monthly, even yearly regimens with novel formulations were explored. A number of phase two and three studies. So one of the original ones was a phase two B study in treatment naive patients, 120 people enrolled. They were randomized to one of three doses of his latrovir combined with 3TC and the non-nuke deraverine. And then that was simplified to a two drug regimen of his latrovir and deraverine. And that was compared to a standard two nukes plus deraverine. They uh, reported the 48-week results showed that uh, roughly 80 to 90% of all the regimens suppressed viral load, and that was durable through 96 and 144 weeks, so two and three years of follow-up. That supported two phase three switch studies, so enrolling over 1,300 people who were suppressed on oral agents. And uh, as you can see, one of the large studies randomized them to continue or change to his latrovir deraverine and allowed all ART regimens. And the ON8 study specifically focused on people who were suppressed on TAF, FTC, and Bictegravir and randomized to continue that or change to his latrovir deraverine. As you can see in both studies, uh, roughly 85% of patients were suppressed below detection at one to two years. And they concluded that the novel two drug formula uh, regimen of his latrovir deraverine was non inferior to continuing traditional oral regimens. And then a phase three study in treatment naive patients was presented at the IAS meeting this summer by Jurgen Rockstro from Germany. It randomized nearly 600 people to that same two drug combo is latrovir deraverine versus the traditional TAF. FTC and Bictegravir, and you can see everyone did well. Over 88% of all patients suppressed below detection at 48 weeks. Once again, declaring his latrovir deraverine was non-inferior. Well, that all looks good. What happened? Well, a toxicity with his latrovir was described, and this is a unique toxicity in that it his latrovir is associated with lymphocyte count decreases. So what you see on the left, the green and purple arms um, in the, or sorry, the green and blue arms are the Islatrovir arms. And we're looking at total lymphocyte counts across three very different studies. But you see all three of them, the bars are going down. The purple arms are the control arms and you can see stability of lymphocyte counts. Then on the right, you see three arms the purple dotted line is the control arm. So you see no change in lymphocyte counts. And then the two green arms are one and two doses of his latrovir. So it appears that this lymphocyte reduction is dose related. And so this led to the FDA putting a clinical hold on his latrovir studies, and then a big study of this toxicity. No other blood cell lines were affected. So neutrophils and other white cells, red cells, platelets, none of them affected by his latrovir. No signals were seen in earlier animal or phase one, two studies. And uh, the manufacturer proposed that the likely mechanism is, is latrovir triphosphate, the active compound intracellularly, 
inhibiting DNA polymerase alpha, and that that led to apoptosis of lymphocytes or cell death. This is not a mitochondrial toxicity. So they studied this and found it was dose dependent, reversible, and not associated with increased infections. And then they did modeling to suggest that lower doses, you could maximize virologic activity and minimize the lymphocyte decreases. So 0.25 milligrams, very small amount daily, or two milligrams weekly appeared to be optimal and not associated with toxicity. And so what they've done is to go on and repeat all the studies I just showed you, but with less dosing of Islatravir. So the lower doses that you see here. What we have to look forward to is a study of weekly oral therapy. So we've often said, what could be better than one pill once a day? Well, maybe one pill once a week. So this is a study that is uh, in progress, phase two randomized open label study for people who uh, have not had prior virologic failure, are on the traditional TAF, FTC, Bictegravir, and suppressed with adequate lymphocyte counts and no hepatitis B. And they go to either continue their Bictegravir regimen or switch to Islatravir plus Lenacapavir with weekly oral dosing. And the primary outcome will be virologic suppression at 24 weeks. They then allow the Bictegravir arm to cross over. So all patients will get weekly Islatravir Lenacapavir. Islatravir is also being used in new implants. And uh, so shown for you over on the left are these implants. The drug is inside. You can see the refill ports. These are small. You see the penny next to it. And they have these openings and then slits. And over time, Islatravir is slowly released from these implants, similar to contraceptive implants. Does it work? Well, they've now published data to show that Islatravir is slowly released over time. And they've done primate, non-human primate studies showing here that plasma Islatravir levels are achieved and durable with the implant in place, that you get Islatravir triphosphate levels that are above target levels, again, the dotted horizontal line, and that you get Islatravir triphosphate levels in rectal tissue as well. So apparently they work in terms of releasing Islatravir in monkeys, and we look forward to human studies. There have been additional implants of Islatravir studied. Um, we heard at Croy about vaginal biodegradable implants, so you don't have to take them out. They just uh, are degraded over time, and they protected macaques against a vaginal challenge. And then there is something they're calling ultra-long-acting implants, so that's three to four years, and these are using refillable implants that don't degrade over time, and they use these and showed 100% protect protection of exposed macaques. So this is really being developed as a preventative strategy. All right, last ARS question. Which of the following HIV drug classes with a new mechanism of action is in clinical trials? Is it RNase inhibitors, VIF inhibitors, maturation inhibitors, VPR inhibitors, or budding inhibitors? Go ahead and vote. Okay, let's look at the results. All right, so two thirds of you were listening earlier when I said maturation inhibitors is a new class in development. So how do they work? Well, the last step in HIV maturation, you have these long polyproteins that are cleaved by the HIV protease, which we know well, and that leads to maturation of the virus. Well, we know how to inhibit the protease, but another way to inhibit this process is to bind the polyprotein subunits together. And that's how the new class of maturation inhibitors works. So you may have heard of these before. We had Bavirumat years ago. However, 50% of people were resistant um, to Bavirumat because of polymorphisms. A second compound came onto the scene, was associated with profound virologic resistance, but had significant GI intolerance and was abandoned. 
Another follow-up compound required cobacystat boosting and was a uh, profound virologic response, but was abandoned because it was thought that no future compounds should have boosting. And then finally, the compound that's on the scene, uh, monotherapy showed potent virologic effect, but drug resistance was seen early and that too was abandoned. So that leaves us with a current candidate that is in clinical development. Then lastly, the broadly neutralizing antibodies. So what's shown for you here is GP120 with different areas and each color corresponds to a place where broadly neutralizing antibodies bind and prevent GP120 from attaching to the CD4 cell. So more than 17 broadly neutralizing antibodies have been now evaluated in humans and generally they're safe and show antiviral activity and have the added benefit of a vaccinal effect. So when they bind to GP120, it primes the immune system to make an immune response. These are now being developed more potent, broadly active with longer half-lives and moving from intravenous to subcutaneous delivery. And combinations are in progress too, combining one or more Broad, broadly neutralizing antibodies, even combinations up to two, three, and four, and then combining them with some of the long-acting antivirals that we've already mentioned. So broadly neutralizing antibodies plus cabotegravir or lenacapavir. And that was the subject of a pilot study presented at Croy this year by my colleague, Joe Eron, a small pilot study of 20 people who were suppressed on their antivirals and then switched to a long-acting regimen of lenacapavir combined with two broadly neutralizing antibodies at two doses. This was a pilot study. So what they did here was administer one time this three-drug combination and then follow people for six months. And what did they find? 90%, so 18 out of 20, were suppressed below 50 copies with a single infusion um, out to week 24. This would be the first six-month antiretroviral regimen moving forward. Again, this is a small pilot study, but uh, led to a lot of excitement in the field. So what does the potential future look like for antivirals? Potentially one-week oral regimens, injectables as infrequently as every six or 12 months, implants, which could either be biodegradable or replaced monthly or perhaps two, three, four years, and then patches, and that's being developed. So in conclusion, ART of the future, well, today we have 35 drugs. We use integrase inhibitors most commonly, one pill once a day, and our first longer acting injectable drugs. But the future, we will concentrate on potent and well-tolerated drugs, but what we're really looking at are improvements in convenience, weekly or injectables that can be dosed every six to 12 months with newer formulations and new drugs and new mechanisms. So that's the future. I'll thank our supporters and we can uh, do some question and answers. Thanks, uh, Trip, for uh, a great review. And I think your last slide really uh, emphasized what uh, pharmaceutical companies, I guess, are uh, going to. And in the rest of infectious disease, we could be very envious of the fact that for most antimicrobials, there's almost no drug development, and there's a huge development for HIV. And I would presume the reason for that is that there is such a large population in the United States and globally. Well, I, I think uh, we said for years that the holy grail with HIV would be one pill once a day. And now we're saying, well, that works for lots of people, but not everybody. So we need strategies that can help other people. Given HIV is a chronic disease, I think people jumped on the bandwagon to try to improve it. Uh, they are applying this to other infectious diseases. So there are long acting hep C treatments. Imagine having a single injection, which could cure everyone after eight to 12 weeks with a long acting prep and then also being explored in tuberculosis, longer acting formulations. So I imagine that these trends will extend throughout infectious disease, if not to all the rest of medicine as well. All right, well, that's a good point. Um, there's some very sophisticated uh, comments. Uh, uh, here's the first one. Is Latrovir 
Is that active against HBV? It, not that I know of. I don't think it is active against HBV. All right. Can you say a little more about Lencaprevir in terms of PrEP? Right. It's being explored right now for PrEP. Um, there are big studies out there called the PURPOSE studies, which are using uh, subcutaneous injection of lenacapavir. And these are being done in different areas of the world right now. We don't have any preliminary information, but a lot of excitement about whether you could have a subcutaneous PrEP agent dosed every six months. So they're looking at uh, MSM, they're looking at African women, US women, we're gonna be part of that study, uh, US injection drug users. So lots of, lots of different populations being studied. How about for HIV-2? Is there anything promising on the horizon? The, uh, a lot of the drugs we have today are active against HIV-2, um, integrase inhibitors most notably. <laughs> Uh, we know that the NNRTIs are not active against two, and then some of the newer agents are not active either. So kind of have to use what we have today. All right. Here's another uh, 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 complicated issue. If you have somebody with real pivorine resistance, would there be any role for a combination of lencaprevir um, uh, plus carbotaprevir? So good, good question. The uh, the number one reason people fail the all injectable regimen is because they have NNRTI resistance. So that's a contraindication for that regimen. Um, a study that I didn't review looked at the factors that led to failure, and that having ropivirine resistance increase your odds of failure by a factor of forty. So we shouldn't be doing that. So as the question intimates. Are there two long-acting agents we could put together um, to re could we replace basically the real pivorine? And the suggestion is lenacapavir. The uh, the issue with that right now is that lenacapavir is only labeled in the product labeling for treatment experience patients who are failing their regimen. So that's not who you want to use it in, according to the question. You'd like to somehow combine it with cabotegravir. I have heard anecdotes from colleagues trying to do that. But obviously, uh, because these drugs require prior authorization, it's a little tricky right now to put those two drugs together. What, what would you do if somebody failed uh, cabotegravir and ropivirine uh, in terms of what you would switch them to? I guess that depends a lot on what happened before that regimen. But Right. And you'd need to have your standard approach, which is to take a good history, try to figure out why they failed it, and then do drug resistance testing. And of course, the concern there is could they have become resistant to integrase inhibitors? So coming off that regimen, you're gonna assume that they're NNRTI resistant uh, as long as they've been uh, continuing their doses and not missing doses. And they may have integrase resistance, so you probably would wanna to go to two nukes plus a boosted PI. Are there any data suggesting that flastemavir can increase T cells? The... The studies have looked at that on the studies of treatment experience patient. That was in the setting of virologic suppression. I think the question is getting to those unique patients who have virologic suppression but are not having CD4 increases. And I haven't seen any data to support that. Um, it certainly could be tested. Yeah. Well, I think that was really a uh, great overview. Uh, one of the things that Don Jacobson always uh, likes to do is exceed your expectations by getting you out four minutes early. So, uh, Tripp, thanks for a great talk. Uh, let me make a few final comments. I think this was really a great uh, series of talks. 